Washington, D.C.'s new streetcar line was ill-planned, ill-thought-out, ill-engineered, ill-everything, recently deceased former Mayor Marion Barry said in 2014. There have been minor accidents, constant engineering problems, and the system has missed its targeted opening date by more than three years. Perhaps D.C. planners never would have embarked on this folly if only they'd studied the long and turbulent history of streetcars in the city. For about a hundred years, these surface-level rail cars crisscrossed the capital. Although they were an important technology in their time, streetcars involved major engineering headaches, and they required an enormous amount of capital investment and maintenance. Contrary to the myth peddled by transit nostalgics, when streetcars finally disappeared from the district in 1962, the public collectively breathed a sigh of relief. Now that the new DC streetcar is finally, allegedly, set to open in a few weeks, there's a new book out called Capital Streetcar that meticulously recounts the story of the old system. The book, which is straight objective history and doesn't take a position on whether building new streetcars is good policy or not, was written by John DeFerrari, a local historian who writes regularly at the Streets of Washington blog. His book begins by describing what it was like getting around Washington, D.C. before streetcars first appeared in the 1860s. It was very tough to travel long distances. Beginning in the 1830s or so, there were so-called omnibuses, like you see in movies of the Old West. They ran over D.C.'s dirty, muddy streets, and they were generally loathed by everyone as being very slow. Uh, very, Mile per hour, roughly? Uh, a couple miles per hour at best. So why um, not just walk? Well, that would, that's a great question. Uh, most people did just walk. Okay, so streetcars come along and they're a really big deal. So what's the technology? What's different? Cars are running on rails. A horse pulling a streetcar can pull 10 times the weight of a carriage. It was leveraging the power of the horses and it did that very well. Electricity fully replaces horses and the streetcar era really takes off. And there's this gold rush of private companies uh, trying to get in. What happens? So DC, beyond the central core, is a very hilly area. You could never have horse-drawn uh, streetcars go out to the what were then the suburbs, the outer part of D.C. And so this was a huge thing. You could build the suburbs and make money selling the houses and people could get down to their work easily. But it was not as big a money-making opportunity as people thought. That was the catch with it. They were very expensive to build and if you had a new suburb just getting started, you would have very few people there to begin with taking the cars and the, and the streetcar line would tend to not make money. Talk about some of the engineering problems. The biggest engineering challenge for DC was how to get the electric power to the cars. The power came through this slot in the middle of the tracks. That slot could get easily filled with ice and snow in the winter. When you had cars running in the 20th century, and the cars had chains for snow, the, the chains would inevitably get get jammed into these slots and wreak all sorts of havoc. Remember that once you had some kind of jam in, in a slot, the entire streetcar line is, is backed up until that, that's resolved. Okay, so let's cut to the, the age of the automobile. Cars and buses arrive, and it, a big turning point is in 1921. The Washington Rapid Transit Company starts running buses alongside the streetcar line yes. and sort of set the scene for me. The buses are zooming by the, by the streetcars. But. Well, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, it's, it's fascinating. We don't, these days, we don't think of buses as being terribly sophisticated or exciting. But in 1921, they were. Uh, the buses uh, were seen as this fabulous new technology. Um, and yes, the streetcars would be trundling along at a fixed speed, usually about 10 miles an hour or so, and they'd be clattering along, and they were these old-fashioned things that we've seen before, and here are these sleek new modern buses uh, with the rubber tires, uh, just go going freely along the road, nimble, and quiet and comfortable and, and just so much better than the old-fashioned streetcars. What did passengers think of these 
did they prefer the old streetcar? Was the bus this necessary evil? Um, no, people preferred the buses uh, when they came out. In fact, Connecticut Avenue was unusual in that it had both buses and streetcars. They, were, they actually charged a premium to ride the bus instead of the streetcar, and people paid it. There is a long and, and hard to, to, to kill conspiracy theory out there that says that, that Standard Oil and Firestone and General Motors conspired to, to eradicate streetcars from American cities. And it is just not true. No, in fact, people wanted to get rid of the streetcars. So there's this 2.2 mile streetcar that's going to run along H Street. Streetcars and regular cars don't always coexist so well on the street. In the early days of automobiles, were there issues as well with streetcars and cars? In the traditional way, it was laid out in the center of the street with islands for passengers to get on and off. The new line runs close to parked cars. It's not the way that the streetcars were done before, and even before it's open, there have been minor accidents. Has the age of streetcars returned? Is this just the beginning? <laughs> well, yeah, that's, it's hard to see that happening. The golden age of streetcars, if you will, from the late 19th, early 20th centuries, was an age when people depended on them to be the vital mass transit system for the city. And that's because they didn't have other options. Because they didn't have other options, yes. Um, and, uh, and a large, very large investment, um, you know, billions of dollars in today's money was spent on, on developing and maintaining that system. And uh, so I don't think that same kind of investment will be made in the modern one. And the modern one, there are many other options now. The modern system only has a limited rationale, uh, if you will. So I think my personal feeling is that will, it will remain a limited part of, of transit in D.C. Okay. John DeFerrari is the author of the terrific book, Capital Streetcars, Early Mass Transit in Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jim. <laughs>